Mm. All right. Thanks, everyone. Please take your seats. We're beginning with session three, um, which is on data availability and benchmarking, which is, of course, at the core of what we're doing here. Um, you can see the speakers here. We're very excited that they're, they're here. Thanks very much to the four of them. And um, I was just mentioning, I was asking them to please just uh, remain seated where they are, because if we line up people during the talks, they actually don't get a chance to see the other, the other talks. Um, we'll, we'll come back at the end. Everyone will be sitting here when we have the panel. And um, so let me just start by introducing very quickly the first speaker. So George Ripsack, he's uh, at Columbia University, so here at the Irving Medical Center, and he's going to talk about data availability and benchmarking, which is the topic of the session, particularly with uh, observational health data uh, and uh, in that area of observational health data science and informatics. George, floor is yours. The um got it. All right. Good morning, and and. Uh, Thank you, Nargis, for that introduction. She mentioned OMOP as at the last talk, and that is this is OMOP, Odyssey is also known as that. Odyssey is this initiative um, that generates evidence um, around the world to promote better care. It's a multi-stakeholder thing, and it's coordinating centers here at Columbia University. Here's our network, 200 researchers from 25 countries, and we currently have half a billion unique patients in our network. So that's electronic health records and claims data to go all together. So that's about 7% of the world population is in our federated database where we do research. I, I left the door. Um, I'll talk Just a little bit more. What we do with that, what do we do? Well, we do three things. We tally things. We do studies, that is, figure out causality. Do drugs cause side effects? And we predict things, patient-level prediction. That's the one most relevant for AI. And I'll show you examples of all three. My job is to talk more about the data, but I want to show you some concrete examples how we use the data. How does uh, so? First of all, Odyssey is an open science initiative, which means all our so all our data, I mean, all our software is open source, but everything we do is on the internet. So when we start working, our results, our temporary results, are on the internet. People ask, "Can I share my slides? You know, can I show your slides on the internet?" Like, yes, because it's already up on the internet. So it's a completely open thing, and I'll give you another example of that later. How do you assemble a half a billion unique patients? It's about two billion patient records, actually, but there's a lot of redundancy because we have multiple records on the same person. So it's about half a billion persons. Uh, it's a federated model. So you keep your data local. You convert your data to a common data model called OMOP. We distribute the question around the world. People voluntarily answer that question, send the results back, then we publish a paper with everyone as an author. This is our common data model called OMOP, which tells you for every little data element where it has to go. It's a lot of work to convert your data. It's being used, actually, I wrote down because there's some as a slide I wish I had put in, but I thought of it afterwards. So like the All of Us Research Program in the US that uses OMOP, the eMERGE network uses OMOP, part of the FDA uses OMOP, the US Federal Food and Drug Administration, the European EMA Drug Administration use, is starting to use it. And the Eden Network in the Europe, European Health Data and Evidence Network, and also the Global Roadmap for Clinical Informatics Standardization, part of the World Economic Forum, is using OMOP. So it's a model that's being used uh, broadly. Extensive vocabularies. In the first talk, you saw uh, mentioned about ICD-9 and SNOMED. So we put everything in codes. What we do, if you're going to do worldwide research, everyone has to use the same code. So we have 80 vocabularies that we've done the mappings from them to SNOMED, ARCS, NORM, and LOINC. And then we publish papers on the accuracy of those mappings, and I can do that at another talk. But basically we've done that assessment and we maintain that working with the U.S. National Library of Medicine. So we're partnered with them to create these mappings from all the data, so like what you read codes in the, in the old UK databases, of Japanese codes, all mapped to LOINC, um, SNOMED, and ARCS, NORM. And you know, just because you have a standard doesn't mean everyone uses that standard the same way. So a lot of our work is in conventions, which tell you, given a data item, how do you put it in the model? Because a lot of times you use the same model and everyone interprets it slightly differently. So how do you interpret those? Then we have software tools for you to convert your data to the common data model. 
We have tools to curate the data that is like a knowledge base of consistency checks that give you a percentage of how accurate it is, then tools to run studies on it, and visualizing the results. So that is how we got to the half billion patient records. So now let me show you how we've used it because I think the strength of a model, like it, a, a bunch of PowerPoint slides mean nothing, is the thing being used for actual research. So first, characterization or tallying. Just to point out, we don't know how common diseases are treated around the world. We know inventory from pharmacy companies, and we know what academic medical centers are doing. So we said, why don't we just ask the question? How a patient gets treated is a large influence diagram. So they don't just follow the guidelines. So in a three week, from in November 2014, we had the idea of doing this study. By within three weeks, seven of 12 databases had their results back to us. So very fast turnaround around the world. That was 240 million patient underlying population. Here are the databases from five countries that participated in the study and published in PNAS, a decent journal. And here's the result, for example, um, this is diabetes, hypertension, depression. This says most people use metformin in the US, metformin in the UK, metformin in every other database, including South Korea and Hong Kong, but not Japan. Japan's the only one that doesn't use metformin. On further study, it appears that the doctors in Japan, whether they're right or not, feel that Japanese patients genetically don't get insulin resistance, so they don't use metformin. Hypertension is less agreement, but still some agreement. And depression, we see the least agreement. These are three US databases, completely different outcomes. And that's kind of, we don't know how to treat hypertension. We don't have good guidelines of what to use first. So if you can code 7% of the world population, you could, in theory, code 100% of the world population with a voluntary uh, network. And we were able to accommodate vast differences in privacy and research regulation. Germany's laws and South Korea's laws are very, very different in privacy. And then just to highlight, uh, howoften.org, just as a nice name on top of Odyssey, for every drug in the world, for every side effect, you know, in SNOMED, which is 200,000 codes, what is the rate of side effects for them? So we just did that on 10 of our databases. We're gonna do that on our entire thing. So when, I, when a family member starts on a new drug, I go to howoften.org and see what the side effect rate is. Population level estimation. This gets to the, the first, the beginning, early in the morning, reproducibility. We do AI, you know, how do we know that what we do is reproducible? But we know the literature isn't. Here's JAMA, BMJ, two good journals. One month apart, same database, the uh, CPRD, same question, does this, do bisphosphonates cause esophageal answer? Yes, no. So what's the public supposed to do when the two top journals you know, have opposite answers on the same database a month apart? So Odyssey is all about reproducibility. One thing we did is we parsed the literature. Here, this is the effect size and the standard error. Let me just go go quickly. This is not significant results. This means the drug causes something, and this means it protects you against it. Here's the literature. You'll notice that people just don't publish negative results. That's the publication <laughs> bias. And if you look here, even worse, this is highlighted right here. What's that? P-value hacking, that's where you get a result of 0.06, and you change the variables until you get 0.04 and publish it. So the literature is a data dredging machine. So what does Odyssey do? Well, it uses modern methods of uh, causal analysis, 60,000 variables. It does something no one else does yet, negative confounding, I mean, um, controlling unmeasured confounding through negative controls. It uses a lot of databases, as you already saw, and it publishes everything. That's a random number seed for one of our studies. So tell everyone everything so they can actually reproduce your study. And then do a lot of hypotheses at once. And in the interest of time, I won't go in. This is actually the diagnostics on a bunch of studies we ran. But we do it on a lot of drugs and a lot of side effects at once. And then we can see the operating characteristics of our study. If you publish one study, I don't know if it's accurate enough. But if we do a lot of studies, I can see how it looks. And here's how it looks. So this is Odyssey's study. And you see we don't have the lacking thing here. We have this still in. 11% are positive, which means 6% are true positives and 5% are false positives because that's the definition of a common symbol. So this is in depression, published in philosophical transactions. Uh, and then we said, so the hypertension guidelines got published by the US last year, by the, UK, by the Europe, by the European Union last month. And we did, a, that's, that's the evidence they were based on. We ran half a million studies on our, across our network. 
found results that are consistent with the hypertension guidelines, although not perfect. The, 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 the guidelines not perfect, so we're publishing that now. But here's the evidence that we provided versus the evidence that the guidelines are based on. So most of the guideline is actually expert opinion, not evidence based. We're filling in that evidence. So that's what Odyssey does. And now, lastly, let me just get to patient level prediction, because that's more AI based. And uh, just quickly, uh, well, this is, uh, let me go right again in the interest of time, go right to the next slide. So, what we're doing, gradient boosting, random parts, regularized regression, we now do deep learning. This slide shows evaluation. So, this morning we heard one way to evaluate, and I like that, and that is, um, you know, to have that sequestered test set. Odyssey does it slightly differently. It's not an alternative, it's a complement. So I'd like to do both approaches. And in this one, what you do is you test your algorithm across all the world's data sets that we have and see its performance. And that's kind of what we're, high level, what we're piloting here. So this is one, two, three of the three different algorithms. We do it on many diseases. So we're predicting, does the patient have diabetes, hyperthyroidism, nausea, stroke, et cetera. So those are many diseases here. These are the different databases. And we see the performance. We see we do well in stroke and acute myocardial infarction. We do poorly in diarrhea and nausea, which are more vague symptoms and probably not recorded in the EHR very well. We also see we do better in private care database and Medicaid. This is just Medicare for the US, so this is older population. We don't seem to be predicting as well. And this is electronic health record data. If I go to the next slide, we can look across databases and say if I generated in this database, if I generated in uh, Optum, but then tested in Medicare, how do I do? And we see that Medicare database, which is just the older population, doesn't translate to the other databases. So this is not the end result, but this is, um, I'm just saying that another way to do this testing of AI is to distribute the package, have each database run it and see the results. And since if you can run it on the entire world population, even if you try to cheat and do a training set, like, you'd have to do a training yeah. to the world population, then you do a test set. If it works in the world population, that's probably close enough. Yeah. I'm not going to worry about yeah. training on the test set, testing <laughs> on the training set. So my conclusions, it's feasible to create an enormous international research network. Sites will volunteer to run studies. It's completely open. Everything we've done is available on the network. Uh, it's a concrete approach to address the credibility crisis, both in, in right now it's on observational evidence that is population-level estimation. But the credibility crisis also extends to AI, that patient-level prediction. And that, you know, it's been mentioned, but it's going to get worse if you start putting systems in place. And then I'll just, if you want more information about Odyssey, it's just on our website, odyssey.org. Thank Thanks, George. Thanks also for um, sticking to the time. So we have actually time also for some questions if you, if you have some burning questions already for George. Yes, there is one. Do we have a floating mic? Yes, we do. There. Hi, thank you for the uh, for the exciting presentation. My question is around the usefulness of AI and its accuracy and reproducibility and your opinion or your expert opinion around using AI in, uh, predict, in predicting on a single patient basis versus in larger populations. And I come from a pharmaceutical background, so I've been in the pharmaceutical industry at the almost uh, 20 years. So I, you know, I look at a lot of these things as opportunities for AI, for example, a number of therapies. So I'd like your opinion. So um, so that third, that last part, so there's population level estimation, as you say, that's the causal analysis across the population, maybe looking at subgroups, stratifying, and we have a lot of experience on that. Our newer area is patient level prediction, so that was that third area that I showed. So those, those green and orange slides I showed were all for patient level prediction, and um, you, so when you do, so we, we do work in uh, diabetes predicting glucose. And if you do a, a type 1 diabetes insulin pump, they use linear methods that are not as accurate but are very predictable. And they do that because they're actually instilling insulin automatically with no human interaction there. So they have to be very sure when they put an insulin, it may not be the perfect amount, but it can't be far off from the truth or they'll kill someone. So they use old-fashioned linear methods, a Kalman filter to do that. 
AI algorithms, deep learning, have a lot of degrees of freedom. So it may be, on average, very accurate, but if in one out of a thousand, it's way off, you could be killing that one person, which would be a high you know, mortality rate for the system. So you need to, you need to evaluate a little bit differently when you, when, when you have to see if you're off by a little bit. So you need like a max function. What's the largest deviation? You don't know the average deviation. What's the largest deviation this thing does? And, and we are actually doing similar work to that type 1 diabetes thing where we're predicting the future glucose. And right now, one of our projects is to come up with an evaluation metric that takes into account uh, that, that um, you know, what is the worst possible thing. But the problem for some of these methods that have so many degrees of freedom, you know, you can't present every possible case to them. So every new patient is, is different from the last. And you don't know if you're in some, if this is a space of optimization, you know, there's some deep, valley there that says give no insulin or give 100 units of insulin suddenly. So I think we have to study it. I think that when things are closed loop systems where there's no human intervention, so we have to start off using open loop systems. That is where the doctor can say this seems crazy to me. And I think that's the safest before we get to the closed loop system that do it automatically. So that is one thing, is just to approach it carefully. All right, thanks a lot. So there are some more questions, but we'll come back to them at the end on the panel. Thanks a lot, George. <coughs> All right, our next speaker, can we get the slides up, please? He's Jean-Louis Rezaro. He's um, at the Yeshiv, that's the uh, University Hospital of Lausanne, with a PhD at EPFL, working on secure and privacy-preserving benchmarking and uh, other systems for health care, and he's going to talk to us about his work. Thanks very much. OK, so. Thanks for the introduction, Marcel. So I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So I'm coming from a slightly different community, so I'm not a data scientist or machine learning expert, but I'm coming from IT security and privacy community. So in this talk, I'm going to try to show you what we do in that community and, and <clears throat> try to prove that it can be helpful also in the artificial intelligence community to solve some of the problems that have been highlighted in the previous talk. Um, so, we know that like uh, this massive digitalization of data and uh, such massive availability brings great promises for uh, improved healthcare, uh, essentially thanks to uh, machine learning uh, algorithms, but on the other side, it also raises important privacy and security concerns that are uh, tied to this data, which is extremely sensitive. And, and just to give you a an idea of the magnitude of this problem, I want to report here a screenshot of the US uh, data breach portal where each institution uh, that has to report by law uh, every time there is, a, there is a data breach that affects more than 580 people. And this actually is a real problem because it's happening almost every week. So. <clears throat> In Switzerland, we, we have taken a, a, an approach that it's, it's a kind of a holistic approach where we combine uh, experts from uh, computer science, so applied cryptography and data science, with experts from ethics, and we, we have recently started a project that is called Data Protection in uh, Personalized Health, so it's a three years project, whose goal is really to explore um, what we call privacy enhancing technologies uh, that can be used to address privacy security, scalability, and ethical challenges that are tied to uh, the concept of P4 medicine. Uh, so the goal is really to define an optimal balance between usability, scalability, and, and, and data protection. And at the outcome of, at, at the end of this project, we, we plan to come up with an appropriate set of computing tools, a real software that is able to perform uh, data science on, on, a, on a privacy preserving way. Um, and it's not working anymore. Yeah. Okay, so the vision is really uh, at the Swiss level. So there's this uh, uh, initiative called the Swiss Personalized Health Network, whose goal is to connect all the university hospitals in Switzerland. Um, so that to, to have a common infrastructure uh, so that data becomes interoperable and scientists can essentially perform research on distributed data. Uh, so the goal of this project is really to have a sort of one-stop shop 
uh, where privacy enhancing technology are used uh, so that data scientists can use this data in a very secure way. So, so the requirements to, for these platforms are, of course, interoperability, as we have seen in the, in the previous talk, uh, reproducibility, scalability, because we're dealing with big data, but also auditability and traceability of everything that happens in the network, um, secure data access, uh, data protection compliance, so there are different regulations, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, privacy preserving uh, process. Okay, so, so in this project, uh, there's a certain number of technologies that we're using, so I just wanted to, to bring them here into the table and, and maybe open the discussion, so I don't know, for example, how many of you are familiar with the concept of homomorphic encryption? Nobody have heard about that. I'm sure you know about blockchains. So, so actually, those are, are a set of tools that we, we commonly use to, to build like privacy preserving solutions. And all of them uh, bring like um, advantages and disadvantages that can be used for specific purposes. So uh, you might know traditional encryption that we use every day, for, for example, for connecting to, to our bank accounts. So this, this actually is, is, uh, is, a, is a technology that we use to protect data when it's stored or when it's transmitted from point A to point B, but it can do uh, really anything else than that. Uh, so there are more advanced technologies, and I'm going to explain a little bit more. So there is homomorphic encryption, uh, which is a specific type of encryption that allows computations to be carried on on the encrypted space. And of course, it brings some cost in, in terms of computation, but we can always trade off uh, the cost with uh, with security. <coughs> then we have secure multi-party computation, which is another piece of technologies that, for example, allows um, untrustful parties to compute uh, parties that do not trust each other to compute like functions on private data without revealing the data themselves. Uh, or we have also trusted execution environments, which are really, uh, it's a new technology um, where, where really we have dedicated piece of hardware that are isolated uh, really at, the, at a very low level where secure computation can take place. Uh, uh, like a recent product is Intel SGX, uh, probably you have heard about that. And there's also the concept of differential privacy, which is a, a notion of privacy that guarantees um, protection from inferences attacks when like aggregate data are released. And of course, distributed ledger, uh, which has nothing to do with privacy, uh, but provide, uh, if used in the right context, a strong accountability and traceability in, the, in distributed environments. So here I'm, I'm going to try to to put on the table how we can use homomorphic encryption basically to provide a privacy-preserving way of benchmarking AI models. So, as I said before, homomorphic encryption is this specific type of encryption that allows you to do operations on the encrypted domain. So, like any homomorphism, uh, it means that there is a mapping between uh, the clear text space, where <laughs> here on the top, and the encrypted space. So, basically, uh, homomorphic encryption guarantees that if there is a computation in the, in the uh, clear text space, there's an equivalent computation in the ciphertext space so that the combination of the ciphertext of the original two messages yields to like the encryption of the combination uh, that you would have get in the, in the plain text. So this is a very powerful technology because it basically allows you to outsource computation on sensitive data to some untrusted environment and always keep the confidentiality of the data um, secure. So one of the products of, of the project I was talking to you about is this uh, uh, software library, uh, which we call Anlix, that provides uh, privacy conscious uh, uh, data sharing. So the idea is really that we have a bunch of data providers that are represented by these uh, small uh, database icons that want to share data between each other, but they don't want really to reveal the data to each other. Uh, so what we introduce is the concept of a collective authority. So instead of uh, doing it the usual way where, uh, for example, data provider would, would trust a single authority for the protection of the data to act as a trusted third party, 
Here we, we rely on a set of servers that together form a collective authority. And basically they can collaborate uh, to create uh, what we have called a collective encryption key. So basically all of them create a key pair uh, for a public key critical system. So I'm going a bit in the technical parts here, but essentially what, what we guarantee is that uh, all these servers collaborate together to create the encryption key that then can be used by all the data providers to encrypt their data. And this basically guarantees that uh, the data is always secure as long as there is at least one of these servers that is compromised. And this means that the trust is not centralized on a single authority, but on a set of, of authorities that we call a, a collective authority. And then because we rely on homomorphic encryption, then you can think that a query or a researcher can take advantage of this data that is always encrypted to perform some computation on it and get back the results without ever having to get access to the individual level records. Okay, so I'm, yeah, can you go on? Okay, so, so, so jumping back to the, to the benchmarking pipeline that was initially proposed by the, white, the, the first white paper of, of, of this focus group, uh, it, it turns out that, is, that this taste data set has to be protected and the whole system has to be transparent and secure, otherwise uh, people will never believe in, uh, in, uh, in the whole thing. So, so the goal is really to how, how do we, the problem is really how do we guarantee uh, that every operation that is performed to evaluate any AI model that is submitted for, for benchmarking has been done in a, in a correct way and how do we guarantee that the test data is really undisclosed. So I, I think you, you, you got the solution already. Uh, can, can you move one further? Okay, so, so, so here we can introduce the notion of collective authority I was talking to you about before, where instead of relying on one single institution to protect this test data, we rely on a set of institutions like, for example, ITU, WHO, and EPFL to generate this collective encryption key that can be used to encrypt this test data. And this test data, because it's encrypted, it can also be stored on the cloud so without any, any problem. And then basically what happens is that <clears throat> once the model is trained on like some private data, it is submitted for evaluation and because the encryption that we're using is homomorphic, then we can run the test, the evaluation directly on the encrypted data. And every operation that is done can be logged on a permission distributed ledger or private blockchain that will also be maintained by the collective authority. And this will, will provide transparency to the whole system. So every time there's there's an operation that is performed on this data set is basically logged onto, onto the blockchain. So ideally what we want to provide by using this kind of privacy enhancing technologies are the following features. So we don't want to rely on a single authority for the protection of the data. That's why we want to use this collective, this notion of collective authority to have trust distribution and we, 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 we will be able to provide end-to-end confi -end confidentiality thanks to homomorphic encryption and accountability and transparency because every operation that we perform will be logged on the blockchain and can be um, looked by anybody involved in the system. So, okay, so to, to conclude, it was... <laughs> To conclude, okay, so to conclude, uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, as, you, as you well know, the confidentiality of the health data is in jeopardy worldwide, so it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem. And, and standardization and regu uh, regulation of AI and health can only be achieved if people trust the whole process to be safe, secure, and fair. And I think I, I try to make the point that Technologies developing the IT security and privacy community can be effective enablers to achieve these goals. So I propose as next steps to explore the feasibility of integrating uh, some of this technology in already existing AI benchmarking platform and try to develop first prototype to really show that this
can actually work. Uh, one, one last slide. So last, <coughs> last but not least, this is like a recent initiative launched by IPEPTA, <coughs> which is the Center for Digital Trust, where essentially um, they have set up uh, a sort of um, tech transfer ecosystem where laboratories or EPFL get in touch with uh, industrial partners around and, and discuss around the topics of digital trust. So I think it's a perfect environment for um, discussing and developing what I've just proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Louis. So I have one question maybe to kick this off. Um, it, um, it almost sounds too good to be true, right? So where's the catch? I mean, if we could do this stuff on, with homomorphic encryption, we would all just flip the switch tomorrow and do it in that way. I mean, yeah, execution on encrypted data, what's not to like? Yeah, so, so as, I, as I mentioned before, uh, homomorphic encryption uh, can't be the cost. Uh, which is in terms of, of computation and, and, uh, and flexibility. So, which means that, like uh, nowadays, uh, we cannot support uh, any uh, AI model we can think about. Uh, so, it has to be carefully designed and, and evaluated. Uh, that said, homomorphic encryption has made like substantial progress over. Uh, the last few years, so stuff that was uh, not even possible five years ago is today possible, so we're able to test uh, neural networks in a matter of few seconds on, uh, on thousands of records, uh, encrypted records. Uh, so, so it's probably not a solution that will be ready tomorrow, but it's something I think it's worth to investigate further uh, because the, the promise is, is, uh, is great. Can you give us can you give us a feeling for what that cost is? I mean, are we talking <coughs> twice, four times, ten times, hundred times? So, so it really depends on the application case. Uh, so, if you compare it to the uh, plain text, I think like a factor of ten uh, in speed, and uh, and then it, it really depends on the storage overhead. It's also it's also a question, but it really depends on on the different application case. Um, yeah, but but as I said, like with careful evaluation, fine tuning, there's, there's we can optimize uh, many things. So okay, yeah. Any uh, burning questions? Yes. Thank you so much for the presentation. Very interesting and challenging to follow. <laughs> um, I have a question concerning exactly these models. Um, there are a lot of solutions out there, not necessarily multilinear, and I'm pretty sure for the homomorphic encryption you have to be kind of a linear space. If you leave that, and if you have a more complex model, uh, I'm not sure whether this is com commutative, you know, because yeah. what, is, what is the mathematics behind that? So I'm, I'm sure that, so I, I could think of that as the limitation, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. And um, that is that does not protect the algorithm itself. It's protecting the data. Yeah. So okay. Right. So so two questions. Uh, yeah. So to to answer your thanks for the questions. Those are that's very, very uh, <laughs> precise questions. So the first to answer the first question, uh, homomorphic encryption is extremely efficient with uh, linear operations, but it's becoming also efficient with nonlinear operations. So. We distinguish in, uh, in like uh, in applied cryptography. We make the distinction between what is like uh, practical homomorphic encryption and, and fully homomorphic encryption. So fully homomorphic encryption supports any kind of operations in the cybertech space, but uh, it's still kind of expensive. Uh, while practical supports uh, linear operations, but also uh, multiplications and and like approximations. Uh, so, so we're getting there. So basically, like a few years ago, only linear combinations were possible, and now it's, it's getting better and better. So as I said, like we can test neural network uh, on encrypted data pretty fast. And, uh, yeah. Actually, Microsoft has done that like, uh, very recently. To answer your second question, uh, it's true. Like homomorphic encryption, as I described it, protect the confidentiality of data, but we can also imagine to encrypt the model 
and test the model, the encrypted model on the encrypted data. So this is also possible. Uh, it will come with any with a, with an additional cost, but uh, theoretically it's possible. Then uh, I've never done it myself, so I don't know how much it would take. Uh, but it's something that will improve uh, in the future for sure. Okay, thanks. So in the interest of time, I suggest we move on. But if you have further questions, please um, please put them up on the channel. Thanks a lot, Sean. Yep. All right, so if we could get uh, the slides up of our next speaker. Thank you. Michele Ferrante is here. That's your microphone. Uh, thanks very much for being here. He's a National Institutes for Mental Health Program Director, and he's going to talk to us about <coughs> computational psychiatry and neuroscience. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for inviting me. So my name is Michele Ferrante, and I started in IMH about three years ago. Um, NIMH is National Institute for Mental Health, like, so we deal with the uh, basic neuroscience, psychiatry, and also like uh, at the intersection between self and intervention. So I, I'm basically, when I started, like uh, there was a very established program in computational neuroscience uh, that was going on for about 28 years, uh, but I was noticing that most of these computational approaches were not translated in, um, in the translational space. Uh, so from that, <coughs> This new program, Computational Psychiatry, started. Um, so we see a lot of like uh, data-driven approaches and a lot of theory-driven approaches in this program. Am I using the right clicker? No. So I want to talk to you about like three ideas that are circulating right now in my program. This can be seen as funding opportunities for uh, scientists in this area, or as a general uh, interest in this field. So one is a span of artificial intelligence, and particularly we want to have like uh, causal methods that are applied yeah, close to the behavioral regulation, uh, because we're interested in causality and we're interested in the same methods. one. So we have some, and yeah. then there is like um, the data-driven validation of something that is uh, an alternative to the DSM uh, for uh, diagnostic classification of patients. So it's the hard <coughs> system, and then there is something new that uh, we are calling computational and defined behaviors for back translation. So, three years ago, DARPA started a program in explainable artificial intelligence. The idea was to combine machine learning with explainable uh, methods in order for uh, us to basically understand what the machine was using to actually classify or predict in, in the variables. So, we would like, so because we, we are interested in understanding how the machine classify and how the machine can make those predictions because we want to learn about those great mechanisms, it, for us it's important also to go back and test experimentally if that, those um, predictions from the explainable AI actually mean withstand the experimental proof. So we are thinking that like we would like to have this type of technology applied to neurosimulation because you could definitely have like a, a causal manipulation and test effect uh, on the brain. So there are very few labs that could do something like this in uh, humans right now and uh, most of them are like probably in animal models at the moment. But last year we found that four projects within the brain initiative that have like electrodes, in, different electrodes implanted in uh, psychiatric populations. Um, yeah, so you can... So the idea is that, that uh, in order for to, uh, to do a project like this, you need to have like a multimodal um, machine learning the, the diffusion. In particular, you are fusing here the neural activity that you're recording from the brain uh, with the, the behavioral activity that you're recording from the mouse, from the mouse or from the humans. So, so the idea is that like uh, machine learning has. Uh, different degrees of accuracy and explainability. Like this could be like different approaches where for instance, deep learning is one of the most accurate at the moment, but we would like to, if possible, move this uh, levels of accuracy in a more explainable space. Um, so there are different uh, ways that like this can be done. One is to apply like different uh, type of labels, not only the labels for classification, but labels for things that we know about the information in the data. So if you're recording brain data, EEG, you can, or like LFP, you can describe in the data and use like label propagation 
features in the data that you know that they exist. Um, so I, ideally, you will be able to basically build hierarchical models for the signal, like starting from the different levels of signal of uh, brain signal that you can record, or the different levels of behavior that you can record. So the the, the main issue is right now that like we are left with questions like uh, we don't know why the, the machine did this and we want to know when it fails, when it succeeds, and if I can trust the model for uh, basically um, using it like in a safe way. So the, the next generation of uh, uh, machine learning will be able to basically um, have an interaction between the user and um, and and uh, the, with the users, like in which the user will be able basically to probe the model with questions and uh, try to understand why it succeeds, it fails, and like what, what are the reasons for that to happen. So we have a few examples, like very we can count them, like probably in less than not even one end uh, of situation of. Uh, Projects where this has been implemented. So this is a project where uh, the brain uh, signal was recorded, and like you have like a, a space and time activation. And um, if you move forward, at the same time, like you have an unbiased way of recording behavior, and um, the machine learning is basically uh, classifying behavior based on standard poses of the animal. And you can look at the priors in the brain activity, and you can try to understand what priors are predictive of a specific behavior or pose that is being unbiasedly defined. Um, so this is like a representation of how the video and the audio, for instance, or the video and the, the two videos for the behavior and the neural activity can be fused together. Um, move forward. Um, yes, you can move next. Um, so, as I was saying, like the idea is like to try to implement in the labels semantic information about the data, or try to use causal model to uh, determine where uh, how to basically disentangle the prediction for um, for machine learning for the classification. Another way is the, the very basic way would be to do feature uh, structure and dimensionality reduction, but that's um, doesn't leave us really with a theory of how these parameters relate to each other and how it relate to the predictor, really. So that's kind of like un unsatisfactory from that perspective. You can move forward, please. Yes, yeah, so uh, we, we recently had like a, a satellite symposium at, at the Society for Neuroscience uh, that was informed by a previous initial report, ARPA, as I was saying. Um, so we, we basically want to be able to understand when, where, and when to stimulate in order to change behavior. And, uh, and we want to be as causal uh, as possible uh, in this closed loop manipulation. You can move to the next thing. So now I'm moving to another uh, topic. So the idea is that like, uh, we can use it. So, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but like uh, um, the research domain criteria is basically a, a way for us to look into patient population by looking at, for instance, uh, not by only looking at the type of symptoms that they present, like in the DSM, but looking at the biology and with a basic understanding that like uh, there is something in the biology that makes these patients um, more similar to each other, and if we know. Uh, that like uh, they are uh, that they have different classes. We can basically target uh, the, the science specific interventions. So this looks uh, promising, but like uh, one thing that is missing here is that we really didn't turn the um, unbiased data driven methods up on us. So if you move forward, so all these things that are actually within the R doc, which is the way that we actually use to classify patients, which are basically behavioral assets that you can give to the patient to record neural activity and behavior at the same time, are actually based on theories. 
So we want to have like convergence of these behaviors. Like so, you have three or four behaviors that are, uh, for instance, testing for fear, and uh, see what they have in common in an unbiased way. So we will use artificial intelligence to actually tell us if two set of behaviors look very similar from the neural perspective. That's probably evidence for breaking them apart from something else that we believe is the same thing. Um, uh, so for this type of uh, applications, we are looking for a collaboration between clinical researchers and computational neurosciences, and uh, it can be both like from the theory-driven perspective or from the data-driven perspective. So we are hoping like to recruit like new um, data scientists. Um, you can actually move forward. With this. Um, we are also interested in accelerated longitudinal studies. And, uh, um, yeah, so, and, and, and having patients that are as uh, possible, meaning from different uh, diagnostic groups. All this works now. Thank you. Try to. Um, yeah. Okay. So, the reason why this is important is because like this will inform uh, behavioral assets that can go like on an iPad uh, on all of us uh, initiative for the precision medicine, or it could use like we could use like neurobehavioral biomarkers in this heterogeneous patient, patient population uh, progress or uh, to use them as a biomarker. So then there is the last um, idea. So this is like has to do with like uh, most of our um, preclinical uh, studies in mice are actually looking at uh, behaviors that are not really relevant to mental health, like pain suspension tests, sucrose preference, um, motor activity, and uh, so we would like to to move most of the um, things that we know for cognitive psych uh, psychology uh, into the. Um, into this space. So, like, the idea is, like, uh, can we break down the behavior in very fine parameters? And uh, the way that you could do that, like, he, traditionally we're done in a theory driven way, but you can imagine that that can be done uh, in a data driven fashion. Um, so, the idea would be, like, to actually collect, break down the behavior in parameters, and maybe having a machine learning algorithm that could um, identify the governing equations that regulate the, um, the behavior. And the idea is that like, uh, once you have these parameters, so in this case, for instance, I'm putting down the different type of parameters that one could be interested in recording, and like the machine learning could generate something like this that would look like a theory, uh, but it will basically generate it by sifting through the different combinations of variables and try to understand what is the mathematical relationship that is underlying uh, these variables. So this is a big gap for mental health, and uh, there are several other things uh, that are in this space. I'm only talking about a subset of them. I'm also a program officer for the Brain Initiative, and um, so if you, if any of you. It's interested in collaborating so in this space. I'll be happy to talk to you. Sure. So, I don't know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any burning questions right now? Otherwise, I would also suggest in the interest of time that we move on and see you. I already, I already saw people posting questions here in your talk, so we can address them there. Thanks very much. Good. Last but not least, no. we have some slides coming up. All right, so Naomi Lee's here. She can have this microphone. Thanks very much. Um, she's at the Lancet, and um, she's going to talk to us about the evaluation of medical algorithms. Thanks very much, Naomi. Thank you. So thanks very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I've already learned a lot this morning. Um, so I met Bastian and Reinhardt at a meeting that we were at in Switzerland a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about this issue. Um, and 
uh, Reinhardt was saying to me, okay, so if an algorithm was 100% perfect, why isn't that enough? And I hope what I'm going to explain to you today is why that is great, but not enough. Um, my background is that I'm a surgeon, I joined the Lancet four years ago, and I'm an editor there, so um, I have a kind of rather conservative approach. So here goes. Um, for those, I know we're quite a mixed audience, so I just want to give you an outline of how we in our camp perceive medical research and medical evidence. So um, 30, 40, 50 years ago, the way that we practiced medicine was very much eminence-based medicine. So the professor said, this is the best way to treat it. And that's what we fill the pages of the Lancet with. Lancet is 200 years old. In the 1980s and 90s, uh, almost uh, started by Archie Cochrane, there was this idea about evidence-based medicine. So this was the idea of like, okay, well, we haven't got very much comparative evidence in medicine. How do we move forward from that? And from that was born this kind of whole ecosystem of evidence-based medicine, which is more or less what everybody practices now, and certainly what the main medical journals like The Lancet operate within that ecosystem. And this ecosystem is of this kind of hierarchy of evidence. So this is, I've kind of cobbled this slightly from what the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine would say, but just to explain to you, so uh, expert opinion is at the bottom, then we have a case series, a case control study, a randomized control trial is considered to be almost the kind of gold standard for an intervention. So that is a, a kind of very carefully defined interventional study. Above that, we would have a systematic review, which is comparing a number of randomized control trials together. And then some people on top of that would put guidelines. And really, where the guidelines came is that once we had this idea of evidence-based medicine, the whole ecosystem just burgeoned. So we had this kind of overwhelming pile of evidence, and what we then needed was, instead of this initial approach, which was the clinician makes a critical analysis of the literature for their individual patient, which to some extent does happen, but then we had to move into this idea where we had these guide, uh, treatment guidelines. So societies like the American College of Radiology or the um, uh, European Urology Association produce guidelines which tells you how to manage certain patients. And that's informed by this hierarchy of evidence. And most of this is based on the very traditional statistics approach. So most physicians come with this kind of idea of we understand randomized controlled trial, we understand about 95% significance, uh, the p-value of 0.05, that's true, okay, then we, then we implement it. And what's the role of medical journals? So medical journals do lots of things, but two things in particular that I want to talk about today. So the first is that because of this ecosystem where we just have this whole pile of research, how, is you, how do you as a practicing clinician know what you need to know in order to change your practice? Well, really the idea is that if you keep in touch with just a couple of the journals in your field and the key medical journals, you understand the practice changing findings. Um, so that, in a way, the, the journals select practice changing research, the research that tells you, okay, now, now you need to stop giving this drug and give this drug because the story is complete. Or some of the top journals also do a kind of first in man. So this is the first uh, time we just saw a face transplant. This is the first time we saw in vitro fertilization. Um, and almost all of the kind of major medical advances come through one or other of the Lancet, the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, or the BMJ. So that's how knowledge goes into the clinical field. The other thing that we do is, as this kind of idea that we're a trusted source of information is around quality assurance, peer review, and applying standards. So we send uh, things for external peer review, we do statistical review, we have modelers, we have economics reviewers, we don't have a lot of AI reviewers. Um, we haven't ventured into that space very much. And that you know, is kind of one of the ideas of me being here to talk to you and understand how we kind of match up. Um, and also we apply these standards. So I want to tell you about the standards that we currently apply to medical research. So we have a number of different ones. First of all, we, most of the major medical journals are signatories to this International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. And that tells us things about how a trial needs to be conducted, how it needs to be reported, uh, what is the role of authorship, what's the role of funding. We are signatories to the Helsinki Declaration, which is about any kind of research which involves human people. We also apply all of the equator network. So the equator network <coughs> describes um, reporting guidelines, but for almost every kind of medical trial. So 
The problem is if you look at the reporting guidelines too late, you can't actually do what the equator network requires you to do. So I'm going to describe the one which is closest to AI at the moment. But just to give you an example, if we wanted to think about the randomized control trial, so that the ability to make that comparative statement that Thomas, I think you made, it does it faster, it does it quicker, it does it cheaper. Well, that is how we, that's where we would say, you know, really the gold standard is a randomized control trial. Maybe there's other ways, but that's the standard. So if we followed the equator network guidance, that trial would need to be registered before a patient had ever entered into it. There's a protocol. The protocol has a statistical analysis plan. In the statistical analysis plan, we have one primary endpoint. That's the one which you can achieve statistical significance for. All of the secondary endpoints are then kind of you know, extra information, but we know it's not the final answer because the trial wasn't statistically powered for that. So we know one in 20 of the secondary endpoints are going to be true by chance. Um, so that's just an idea of what the equator network tells us when it comes to randomized control trials. And then every journal has their own information for all of this, which you know, kind of largely follows the things I've just discussed. So the equator network. The equator network, as I said, does reporting guidelines for all kinds of health research. If it was a randomized control trial, it's the consult guidelines, there's CHEERS, which is for economic guidance, there's for genome-wide association studies, there's for epidemiological studies. Um, there isn't one for any kind of AI intervention. And I know the Equator Network have discussed this and probably won't do it. The closest that we have at the moment is this tripod, so transparent reporting of a multivariate prediction model for either individual prognosis or diagnosis. And the kind of key the key thing to note is, first of all, it's about explaining how prediction models were developed and validated. And the idea is that it's generalizable and free from bias. And, and the kind of key thing to note from this is that it requires external validation in a separate data set to achieve the kind of uh, the gold standard of tripod, which is what a lot of the main medical journals are looking for. So the reason I pull this out is because when we get submitted a lot of AI research, and we do get a lot, but we've published very little, and I can only assume that it's the same for all of the other main medical journals, that even if we were just looking at something like a kind of really great prediction model, if it's not validated in external data set, it doesn't meet that kind of gold standard for evidence that we consider ourselves to be in the sphere of publishing. So it's not we're not even in this in the realm of making a comparative statement, we're literally just saying, does it work? Well, if it hasn't been shown to work in an external separate data set, we wouldn't consider that it had achieved the level of evidence required for publication in one of the major journals. And when we say a separate data set, we mean if you develop it in the data set from uh, Oxford University, you then need to validate it in the one from Cambridge or somewhere else. Because otherwise, how do you, there's so many potential confounders, how do you know? that you haven't just picked up a confounder. You know, a silly example, but we, you could say something like, okay, every patient who has such and such a test does better, but then it turns out that that test is only done by that professor, and it's actually that professor that has better results. So if, if things aren't validated in the external data set, then the chance of confounding is much higher. So then I talked about this idea of practice changing. What's practice changing? So. There's three kind of different levels of what we would consider required in order to be a practice changing statement. The first of all is this idea of accuracy of diagnosis or predictions. I think we all understand that. You guys understand that better than I do. Um, one problem that we have here is that the data science and the health communities talk about it in terms of different language. So we don't use F1, that's meaningless to us, but we understand sensitivity and specificity really well. So just by kind of flipping that, that really helps with kind of engaging the right audience. The second is about the evidence of efficacy, which I don't think we have really achieved for many things. So this is about selecting a clinically meaningful endpoint. So clinically meaningful isn't, it is better characterized, it is you increase somebody's lifespan, you save more people, you, um, it's not kind of surrogate endpoint, like uh, blood loss to some extent, it's a surrogate endpoint blood loss, is meaningful, but it's only meaningful in that it affects somebody's quality of life or their time in hospital or um, whether or not they recover or require a blood transfusion which develops further illnesses. So it's this idea of something which is genuinely clinically meaningful, so something that's changing the medical world. And the other idea about efficacy is that it's 
compared against the current standard. So it's fine if something works, but it doesn't help us if it doesn't work better than what we already have. And I think you know this is a kind of next big step for this one that we're working in. It's proving that it works better than the current standard. And the third idea, which the Lancet has kind of, you know, to some extent less interested in, uh, and is more of a kind of systems level, is this idea of cost effectiveness. If it's loads more expensive, then it's really difficult for people to implement. So why is that a problem? Why is it a problem that the AI community is researching their stuff over here and the health community is just getting on over here with our kind of normal conservative work? The problem is that everybody loves new technology, especially really hype new technology, but when things are adopted without proper assessment, it causes patient harm. So I put up a couple of examples here. The first was about vaginal mesh. So I'm sure it's been the same in the States as it has in the UK. The studies that were performed about vaginal mesh, they were very short term, they were rather small. And when people began to understand the scale of the harm, it was kind of too late. So the, kind of the, the comparative trials have been done, but they were very, very small. And the long term kind of observational registry trials haven't been done. Um, and so the backlash against the mesh surgery is now so huge that everywhere that mesh is being used, so where it's being used for hernia repairs, where it's being used for kind of intra-abdominal surgery, everybody's going back and re-evaluating. And so there's a complete loss of trust now in that kind of mesh surgery. Um, a similar story for the evaluation of robotic surgery, specific to my own field of urology which is um, everybody loves robots. It's so exciting that we're going to have this new robot. And it was there was a huge financial benefit because there's only one robotic surgery company, but also to the hospitals who attracted a huge number of patients for robotic surgery. It was adopted 10 years after it was adopted. We had the first randomized control trial, and it showed that the two surgeries are more or less equivalent. So in those 10 years, we had retrained an entire generation of surgeons we have probably put a number of people through a surgery which, in 10 years after it was first introduced, it was equivalent, probably wasn't equivalent at the beginning of those 10 years. So, you know, it's fine, but what happened with robotic surgery is that we quickly reached a point where there was no clinical, there, there was no kind of clinical uncertainty. Everybody was so convinced that it worked, it was very difficult to do a trial. And when they eventually managed to do one, the results were kind of, you know, okay, it's the same. Um, and then the third example I wanted to bring out was kind of more current, more pertinent to the field, was about the patient-facing digital symptom checkers. So in the UK, we just had a really big program rolled out, which is um, using some of uh, Babylon Health, so using GP at hand. And one of the things that it's offering is this patient-facing digital symptom checker. I mean, everybody's very excited about it, but it's not validated. So we're rolling this out in a huge population scale, we're investing in it, and we don't really understand if it works. Um, so this is some, just some coverage in the Lancet pointing this out. So I hope I've convinced you that going through this kind of very traditional model of uh, health research is beneficial, you know, in order for a couple of things, beneficial for the patients, beneficial for the community in building trust, um, but also beneficial in kind of achieving the transformational results which are much promised in this area. So I wanted to just go back to a couple of these common pitfalls because often it seems relatively addressable, uh, especially things like the external validation or the idea about demonstrating clinical efficacy. So just to kind of bring the idea of what we consider to be a positive trial in, in the field to this community. Um, so how do we kind of bring this research into what I would call is like my mainstream? Um, so we definitely need to think about standards. You know, at, when we are assessing research, we have a kind of shorthand for how we know research is good. So it's uh, appropriately statistically powered. It's been through the ethics committee. It's reported according to the guidelines. And that helps us know it's good, it's reliable, it's trustworthy, it's robust. OK, is it practice changing? Yes, we can go ahead and publish it. And I think I just showed you how when those things are published by these high-powered medical journals, you know, that is the key to achieving patient and clinician trust and moving into transformation and into practice. Um, does, does what ITU is discussing help us? Yeah, definitely, of course, because now we're getting algorithms and we don't really know, you know, we don't, un we don't know how to assess them. You know, we don't have, as I said, a lot of um, 
and reviewers who are skilled in AI. We don't, there's not a great community of people who are, have got a foot in each camp and that don't have any kind of conflict in the area. So uh, it's difficult for us when we come to review it. We don't know. Um, yeah, we just don't, we don't have the same framework for reviewing this kind of evidence. We have our traditional framework. We know we need something which kind of is adapted or adaptable. Um, we know we need reporting guidelines. And we know that, you know, there might be a case for us to change from this kind of, you know, model that I've just described. What AI does, what, um, what this idea about this huge electronic databases, the electronic uh, health records gives us is another way of answering questions which might not be in our CT. And we've published a lot from the CPRD database is another way of answering these questions. So it's not that we're not willing to kind of change and that we can't change, but we know we need to keep the kind of standards that we've had because that is the way, um, as Geraldine said, not to fail because we cannot fail. Um, so finally, just thank you. I hope that I've succeeded in uh, showing you how we need, how the medical academic community needs to move forward, but also how we need to find a kind of point of convergence and conversation. And, you know, it feels like it's within touching distance, and that's what we said at the Lancet before, but, you know, it needs us to work outside our silo communities, um, and I'm really happy to be here today and start that conversation. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may I ask the other speakers um, to please come here? And then, as promised, I will give preference now to pigeonhole, otherwise it makes no sense to keep using the system before we go to others, and we will go a few minutes into a lunch break, but we have a top medical expert on this panel, we have a top technical expert, we have a, an executive director of a top channel, and we have um, a program director from NIH, so I, I don't know how much more you can ask for from a panel, so allow us to go a few minutes into the lunch break. First of all, um, Let's take this question about explainable AI. I'm not sure if we get it, so Jack, if you're in the room, can you raise your hand? And um, just um, phrase it again. So, um, it's not entirely clear what you mean. At so least to me. I don't have that much training uh, in models, but what I get taught multiple times is about using a model for inference versus prediction. And it seems to me that uh, there's something about that there isn't a unique solution that it limits how much you can use it for inference. And is that an issue in this area um, that's relevant? So um, if I can come in interject, like one of the issues that we have, like, uh, and it was brought up by somebody before, like, uh, is the issue that actually uh, our ground truth is actually very, very noisy. Uh, so both our diagnosis, our symptoms, our um, reports from the patients uh, are not very precise. Um, so one way that you have to do that is like uh, you could apply those label and try to predict those labels. I and mean, people have been doing that. Uh, but Another way could be to actually allow the machine to unbiasedly make those passes and like try to see how the data segregates independently from our labels. So I agree with you, like they need to make sense and that's why we want the explainable method behind it. And if like the explanation doesn't make sense to us, we can start from scratch. Yeah. But like we want to actually try to find like uh, classes uh, that are biological meaningful and that we could ideally target with one of the interventions that we have available. We have very few interventions and uh, we didn't do a very good job at stratifying patient populations to deliver the right intervention to the right person. That makes sense. George, there was a question for you there. Um, whether what are you aware of other organizations that use the Odyssey model as a lingua franca? Um, can you well, comment we'll on that? Is Omar, well, it's um, you know the All of Us Research Program in the U.S., the Emerge Network in the U.S., the Biologics Division of the FDA, 
Um, EMA, so some work in Europe, the EMA, and there's this initiative, EDEN initiative. So there are several organizations using it, and then there are medical centers that use it. So there are actually a fairly large number of places using the OMOP data model, which may not, in fact, some of them are and some of them aren't on the Odyssey research networks. In other words, they put their database in the OMOP data model, but then they don't necessarily run our studies yeah. for us. For those outside of the U.S., how, how many people are planned to be enrolled in the All of Us um, cohort? Oh, a million, so the, it's a U.S. program to enroll one million patients one uh, in the U.S. and get both their electronic health records and their genome. And so we're, you know, partway, we have about 100,000 so far. Okay. Thomas, you had a comment or a question? Yeah. So, no, we thank you for your talk. I, it got me thinking about the whole metric question that we are having uh, in our plan work. Um, a randomized uh, con uh, control uh, trial is, of course, the gold standard when you have feedback in the system based on treatment that is based on something different. So when the treatment is different, and the diagnosis is different, and the treatment is different, etc. cetera. Um, that, and, and here we are looking at, for instance, a diagnosis support tool, where we could imagine uh, we have a randomized control uh, trial that involves either immune experts to do the diagnosis, and then the AI method to do the diagnosis, but then we have the feedback on the on the on the treatment, and then introduces noise because we don't know whether the treatment is a good treatment, right? It could just uh, 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 there be a problem. And then the other question I would have is that uh, could there also be a view on a randomized control trial where you where we we have all this test data that are unknown, and it's kind of a a, a verification relative to um, numbers obtained from patients as well. So, so the, the, if you think about it, the, the randomized control trial is something that just we start now, we have this thing, and then we run it, and then we wait a couple of years, and then we have the result. Now we already have already collected data in the past, and we can uh, a posteriori apply something to those. So, so where is that uh, thinking there? Yeah, okay, two great questions. And the first one for me is uh, really depends on whether you're using the tool for diagnosis or for prognosis. So I think a bit towards what Jack was saying. If it's a tool that you're using for diagnosis or for assisting physicians' diagnosis, then I think you know we wouldn't then expect to see something like my advice control trial. Really, that's comparing to whatever the current gold standard is. And if that's you know physician diagnosis, that's fine. Um, and then some kind of external validation in a separate cohort. So I think that is what would set, you know, if, if that's what can set that kind of research into a kind of sphere of, I mean, close enough to a good estimate that it falls into the kind of medical realm. If we were then using that tool for a prognosis, well then that's different. And I think that is kind of what we, what we collectively anticipate might be possible. So if, for example, um, Jeremy, we can talk about lung modules. So as I understand it, the idea with lung modules is you, uh, we pick up loads of lung modules because we do loads of imaging. We know that some of them are benign and incidental, but we know that some of them are going to go on to develop lung cancer. And the idea around the lung module problem is to work out what they are, if we can work out what they are, which are benign, and then which are going to be malignant and then to form an action plan based on that. So I think that's where you want to see some kind of comparison, because if you're making a treatment decision, what we, especially with the technology which is as untested, so if we then, you, you would imagine some kind of comparison where you said, okay, this is a group of patients on whom we use the prediction and follow that results, and this is a patient on whom we use the current physician's best guess, and we follow those results. And what we would hope to see is some kind of difference. Um, so, you know, that's a kind of rough idea about how that would work. The second question, I think, was this kind of idea about um, very difficult and very expensive to do a randomized control trial. Um, it takes a lot of time. We already have a lot of data that we've already collected. Uh, what can we do with it? And I think that's, you know, the kind of more gray area. You know, the first question had a really nice clear answer, and the second question has less of an answer. Um, 
like I said, I was a surgeon before I joined the Lancet, and we had very similar debates in surgery. So we, most of our kind of understanding of trial methodology comes from oncology. It's quite easy in oncology because you give a pill or some kind of medication and it's fairly standard and we see some kind of results. In surgery, it's very difficult because, um, firstly, people either want surgery or they don't. Um, and so it's very difficult to randomize people in surgery. Uh, surgeons have different levels of skill. Um, we don't want to say it, but it's true. So it's, uh, there's a kind of a, a, a personalized effect. Um, and lastly, there's a big placebo effect with surgery. You know, more so than any other medication, you can't, you know, you have to think about what kind of placebo you're going to do. So surgery had to kind of develop its own field based on the, the kind of uh, data that it had. So um, it, it made uh, academic groups around evaluation, and it looked at how we used uh, CPRD, the surgeons used quite a lot for observation. And I think this is where you know, I don't necessarily have the answer as to what we would accept as an alternative. We know that we, we have to do different ways to um, We know we have got the data, we know it's more real time. Um, and I think that's where we as a community need to have a conversation and say, well, what if we are thinking about health and life and in the kind of academic space? What do we now pose as the alternative? You know, we can imagine that actually you could do some kind of comparison, but the, the, the feedback time would be much, much shorter, or um, we could use some kind of secondary measures in the interim. So I think it's kind of all effort to play for, you know, it's for us to kind of have a conversation and decide, but it's that work that needs to be done in this area and how we have a lot of strengths when we think about data and how we can maximize those strengths in order to avoid just kind of copying what the have done and what we've done. Okay, we have time for one last question. Just a quick question. So, is this uh, homomorphic uh, encryption? So, as far as I understood, so you, you don't need to retrain your model, right? So, you, you can kind of come up with operations in on the homomorphic data, homomorphically encrypted data, which kind of correspond to, for example, convolutions in the original space. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. That, that, that's correct. So, so in the in my presentation, I described a, a, an application of homomorphic encryption only for testing models that you have already trained on, on data that is uh, in the clear text. Of course, uh, I just want to emphasize that homomorphic encryption is one of the solutions that we that we could use, and it's it's um, it can be very efficient for for testing models, but for training, it's still uh, it's still uh, it's still immature. All right, so I would love to have more time uh, to quiz this um, panel, but we have to move on. We um, reconvene at 1.45, if that's correct. Yep. And please uh, join me in thanking those fantastic speakers again.